You know, Sam, just before we start, I want everyone to understand your story because you have such an interesting background in the tech ecosystem. You know, help us walk us through from graduating Stanford, not, not graduating, joining Stanford, dropping out, running Y Combinator, running a different startup before that, and now running OpenAI and a number of things. Just help us understand how you came to where you are right now. Yeah, so um, I, I started at Stanford, uh, where we met, and I fell, in, I mean, I was already in love with computer science, but I really fell in love with it once I got there. Uh, I actually went to study AI, but at the time, AI was really not working at all. In fact, very memorably, one of my professors said, the only sure way to have a bad career in AI is to work on neural networks. We've decided those don't work. Um, and so I got kind of discouraged, and I started a company. Uh, that was a great experience. The company didn't work out that well, but I kind of like learned about startups and thought they were a very powerful force and something I was very excited about. So I then be ran YC for a while. And while I was doing that, I uh, got newly excited about the idea of startups that take on hard technical challenges. And I sort of thought it was curious to me more people weren't doing that. Um, it seemed like a really valuable opportunity. With some other people, started OpenAI as one of those examples, and many other things which have uh, gone on to be pretty exciting, but really fell in love with OpenAI. Um, once it seemed clear that we were really going to have a chance at making true general purpose AI, like a system that could do what a human can do and contribute new knowledge to society, I got like really excited and wanted to go work on that. And so stopped being an investor, and now I do that. Amazing. So, so first of all, what is OpenAI? Is it just ChatGPT? Are they the same thing? Are they different? Just help us understand what the company does. We are a company that is doing research and deployment to try to figure out how to build AGI and how to responsibly deploy that into the world for maximum benefit. So this is unlike other technologies. Well, other technologies are like this too, but this is a strong case of a technology that on the one hand is the most exciting, most promising, coolest thing I think that humanity will have yet built. Uh, we can cure all disease, we can give everybody a great education, better health care, massively increased productivity, huge scientific discovery, all of these wonderful things, and we want to make sure that people get that benefit, that benefit is distributed equitably. And on the other hand, uh, there are the obvious concerns about the power of this technology used in, in a negative direction. And so we want to be a force to help manage those risks so that we all get to enjoy the, the benefits. ChatGPT is definitely what we're best known for, so I guess they're sort of synonymous at this point, but OpenAI is really about this quest for AGI. Interesting. So, so help us understand, I mean, all of us have played with it, right? We have poems getting written by it, we've all asked it fun trivia questions to learn answers, but help us understand you, you, uh, you know, without a doubt, have a better understanding of how it's getting used all around the world in all sorts of different industries, vocations, reasons. Talk to us a little bit about some of the most interesting things that you've seen. Like, for example, what's the most surprising use case of some of the technologies that you guys have built that you've seen recently? So the main thing I would say that's interesting about it is its generality. There's a lot of other systems that can go do this thing well or that thing well or this thing. And, and you know, in many cases, better than ChatGPT. Some not. Like, there's not probably not a AI that can write a better poem or whatever. But you know, other categories, you could find something that's maybe better. But the fact that this one system is truly general purpose and can do so many things means that people are integrating it into their workflow as a very powerful tool. And so the same thing that can help you write computer code, um, one of the areas that we've seen the biggest impact is what coders are using this for, doubling, tripling their productivity. Um, you know, there was an, a paper that just came out that when Italy temporarily banned ChatGPT, developer productivity like fell in half um, on like a fairly big study. And, but it can do that. It can also, you know, help you find information. It can help you write a poem. It can help you summarize documents. It can translate things. And people are using this, which we hoped would happen, as this sort of super assistant that just makes them more and more productive. And it's that generality that I think is the coolest part. So with, with so much ability that maybe even you guys haven't even thought about how people are using it when you, when you developed it and launched it, um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of interesting use cases right here out of India itself. 
Can you tell us something or just give us an example of something you've seen that's really inspired you that you've seen come out of the Indian market? So India has been a country that has really truly embraced ChatGPT um, in a way, maybe you can tell me why, I'm sort of curious, I'm hoping to learn while I'm here, we're very delighted, but uh, there has been a lot of early adoption and real enthusiasm from the users. One of the very earliest things, like in the first weeks of launching ChatGPT, um, we heard about a farmer in India who wasn't able to access government services and via like ChatGPT hooked up to WhatsApp in some sort of complicated way was then able to. And that was like, that was like one of the early things where we're like, huh, we did not think that was going to happen. And, and just to you know, expand on it, so, so what I've understood about OpenAI is ChatGPT is one implementation of the things you've built, but you have capabilities to real-time translate uh, to transcribe audio into text, and, and are you seeing people use these in combination in ways that are surprising? Well, we, we recently launched an iPhone app that has uh, speech recognition in it, which is, that's hooking up two of our models together, and, and people love that. But the, the main point that I would like to get across is none of the current systems really matter. Uh, like, we're going to look back at GPT-4 and, you know, I don't know if any of you have like picked up an I uh, the original iPhone in recent years, but it's like, wow, I cannot believe we were excited about this. Each pixel's like that big, you know, it's, it just feels like this like incredibly antiquated thing. Um, the curve here is gonna be much, much steeper. And what the systems are gonna be capable of in the not distant future, we think, is gonna be very dramatically different. So this is like a system that I don't even know what the right, this is like the old first like grayscale Nokia phone that looked like a little candy bar. And the iPhone 14 is coming. So what I would say is it's a mistake to get too focused on the current systems, their limitations, their capabilities, the impact they're having. The thing that matters here is we are on an exponential curve, truly. Um, two, two big miracles I think in the field, number one, we have an algorithm that can genuinely, truly, like no tricks, learn. And number two, it gets predictably better with scale. And that, we're gonna look back, I think, on those two realizations as a turning point in human history when you put them together. But what it means is that the rate of progress in the coming years, the capabilities are going to be significant. So it's totally cool that ChatGPT can write that poem when a future system can like cure all disease or help us address climate change or radically improve education uh, or make us all like 10 or 100 times more productive at what we do, that's quite impactful. It's amazing. Now, let, let's flip to the other side of this because there's no doubt there's incredible power in this technology and you know, with that comes challenges. I wanna play a clip, uh, maybe you guys can put on a clip of something I recently heard Sam uh, speak somewhere and we can talk about it a bit. Could you uh, play the clip, please? Hi, my name is Sam and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you all for joining. I also wanted to say that the gentleman on stage with me is incredibly good looking. And I also want to say that you should be very careful with videos generated with artificial intelligence technology. Okay, so you didn't say that recently. Clearly that was just a, a, a ploy here, but, and thank you, by the way, it was very Totally kind. agree with that part. Um, but, <laughs> But nonetheless, I think it raises a real question, right? When, you know, this video, if you look closely, you can see the lips aren't perfectly synced, but like you said, this stuff is only gonna get better and exponentially better. Fundamental questions are on authenticity. What's real and what's fake? How do we handle that? Yeah, so that was like deeply in the uncanny valley. It's very strange to watch, but <laughs> we're not that far away from something that looks perfect. And there's a lot of fear right now about the impact this is going to have on elections and on our society and how we ever trust media that we see. I have some fear there, but I think we're actually going to, when it comes to like a video like that, I think as a society we're going to rise to the occasion. We're going to learn very quickly that we don't trust videos unless we trust the, the sort of provenance. We'll have techniques like watermarking detectors. More than that, I suspect at some point if people are saying something really important, they'll cryptographically sign it. And you know, web browsers or phones or whatever will build in some ability to say, okay, this is authentic. But that part we can, that part we can all uh, adapt to. Like we did this with Photoshop, there was a period of time where people thought if you see an image, it's gotta be real. 
we learned, we're like, okay, you know, that thing is Photoshopped, it happened quickly. Videos like that, that'll, society will build antibodies quickly. But there's a related thing that I think is getting discussed less, which is not the ability to generate mass media like that, but customized one-on-one -on -one interactive persuasion. And I think people are gonna be able to create AIs that are very good at this. So it won't just be like, you know, I'm watching a video of you, but it'll be like, I'm chatting with you back and forth, and it's like the most interesting, compelling conversation that I've ever had that's like affecting me in ways I don't know about. And that's a new thing that's different than just generated media. Again, I think we'll find a way to build societal antibodies to it, but I don't think it's discussed as much and it's gonna be a challenge. I also wanna talk about jobs because the, the natural fear is AI is gonna make us redundant, particularly in markets like India where we have so much of a workforce and a lot of it is oftentimes doing somewhat rote work. Should we be worried about this? I mean, does this affect societal disruption on employment and capitalism and all the things and how we've been running? I mean, to some extent, yes. Every technological revolution leads to job change, and this will be no exception. Um, I guess three thoughts. Number one, job change itself is fine. Uh, you know, if you kind of look at the history of this, in two generations, we can kind of adapt to any amount of labor market change, and there's new jobs, and the new jobs are usually better, and that's gonna happen here too. Some jobs will go away. There will be new, better jobs. They're difficult to imagine as we sit here and dream about what the future's gonna look like. The thing that might be different about this is the speed with which it could happen, and I think it will require a change to the socioeconomic contract and the way governments think about this, if it, if it happens at a very fast pace. The second thing is it's not going the way people predicted so far, and I don't think it will in the future. So the current systems are actually not very good at all at doing whole jobs. They're very good at doing tasks. And so the, the nature of the job, if you're, say, a computer programmer, to stick with that example, shifts to you kind of like manage a team of extremely, extremely junior developers they can only do one one minute task at a time. And then someday they'll do 10 minute tasks and then they'll do an hour task. But you'll still have to think of like, how is this all gonna fit together, what I wanna build, and you know, maybe eventually it learns that too. But this idea that instead of replacing jobs, it's making people dramatically more efficient and there is such a demand overhang in most places. You know, if we can overnight make the world create three X more software because we make every software developer three times more efficient, that is not nearly enough. That does not nearly fulfill the demand the world has for software, and I think we'll see that in many other places. Um, so a another example of this is that the consensus, n not the consensus, the like absolute belief of experts around the world 10 years ago, first AI is gonna come replace the physical labor jobs, so truck drivers, farmers, factory workers, real trouble. Then it'll come for the sort of easier kinds of cognitive labor, then maybe eventually like computer programmers, even a mathematician, and then you know, way in the future or maybe never because maybe it's like magical and human, the creative jobs. And of course we can look now and say it appears like it's going exactly the other direction, but that was like really non-obvious, certainly to us. We started thinking we were gonna build robots and it still, in some deep way, sense to me, seems like it should be much easier to make robots than it is to make GPT-4, but here we are. I think with other job impacts, it's just gonna be surprising, but I think the world will get way wealthier, we'll have a productivity boom, and we will find a lot of new things to do. Interesting. You talked about robots, and you know, we've talked about sort of the, the real practical, likely disruption that we're gonna see because of AI, but we also have to talk about that 1% like extinction risk or that robots are gonna come and take over our lives. H how do you think about that? I mean, you have actually been probably more so than the average person um, cautious about this. And, and for us, we kind of think of it as sci-fi, kind of like in the, in the realm of not really realistic but interesting to talk about. But I think you would say it's, it's something real that we have to think about. Help for, me understand for sure. it. Like, I, I want to be super clear. I don't think current systems are dangerous. I don't think there's any way that GPT-4 like, causes an existential risk to the world. But people are very bad 
at thinking about exponential curves. And GPT-10 may be a extremely different thing. Given the importance of getting this right, even if it's a 1% chance, uh, I think putting a lot of effort into thinking, studying like how we align an AGI, how we design safe systems at this kind of scale is super important. Um, and starting that early is really good. I think we can totally manage through it. I think we're developing techniques to, to mitigate it. This is really why we started the company. This was like our initial focus and still is our most important focus. Um, but yeah, we need to address this. So is there like a power switch in the back of your office that nobody knows about where you yeah, can just like pull? It's like that thing in Jurassic like, Park, that giant. Yeah, yeah, it has to be big and dramatic, yeah. but you pull this big right. thing and it shuts down all the systems if exactly, we need it? Exactly like that. Okay, good, good. I'm glad, I feel better now. Okay, and it works even if you're traveling, right? I mean, yeah, okay, anyways. Um, so let's talk about regulation because, again, I think what's really unusual is this company is a few years old, but really for the, for the consumer, it's like less than a year old because of ChatGPT. And yet here you are traveling the world, meeting leaders globally to talk about the importance of regulation. And not only are you doing that, you are probably one of the most vocal people saying we need it. And not one of those, you know, we'll regulate ourselves, leave us alone type of things. You are saying governments need to step up, understand this, and get involved. This is very weird. This is not like how most startups operate. What's going on? Well, again, we started the company because we were b nervous about AGI risk before you were really before people even talked about AGI. Um, and now I think part of the reason we deploy systems is so that people confront the technology, feel it, understand the risks, the benefits, and now a lot of other people are also very excited but sharing the concern. Uh, I think this is a special moment where the globe can come together and kind of get this right, and we certainly would like to try to do that. So let's talk a little bit more about AI in India because it's so unique for us and there's so many interesting use cases that are very India specific. You know, one of the obvious questions we think a lot about are languages, right? India has one of the largest depths of languages, hundreds of languages in the country. Now, AI is by and large trained on what's publicly available, what's available on most of the internet, which is you know, inevitably gonna be mostly English, probably a lot more Western focused in terms of just the sheer quantity of stuff that goes into training. How do you think about biases? How do you think about inclusivity? How do you think about multilingual countries like India and making a product that's relevant, that's useful, not just for all of us fancy people sitting in Bombay and Delhi, but for you know, everyone in the mass of the country? Yeah, it's, it's super important to us. Uh, we had a big step forward from GPT 3.5 to 4 at non-English languages. So GPT-4 is, is pretty good at, say, the top 20 languages and okay at maybe the top 100. We will be able to push this much further. Uh, you know, it's challenging for us for very small languages spoken by you know, only a few tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. That, that's difficult. But the systems are fundamentally going to be very good at this, I think, and it's important for us to do. Now, as you were saying, it's not just the language. It's also the history, the culture, the values, and we want the entire world represented in here. Uh, there will be some areas where the world's got to agree on, like here, the sort of global bounds of the system. But mostly, if you want to use it in the US or in India, that can be under a different legal framework. And then in different parts of the culture, in each place, it'll, it'll be very different. And I think that should all be represented in there. We recently launched a new program to give out grants for people to want run experiments of the ways we can do this, uh, the way we can collect this. But we, we really, really want to. You know, India has been particularly unique and successful globally at building a lot of the underlying technology stacks to support new innovation in digital with the India stack, UPI, Aadhaar, things like this. Do you think India should build its own LLM, AGI, AI, AI engine? You know, in some sense, should we think of this a little bit like nuclear technology where every country should be building its own capabilities and, you know, a little bit more nationalist in the way we think about this? I mean, how do you think as a country we should think about AI as something in a sovereign sense? First of all, it's super impressive to see what India has done, I think, in a way that really no other country has uh, with these sort of saying we're going to do national technology really well and, like, make it a... a really like a national asset. 
Uh, in terms of AI strategy, I think there's like a lot of things that can work. I think this question of sort of AI sovereignty, none of us have an answer to yet, feels like it's gonna be at least somewhat important. But the main thing that I think is, is important is figuring out how to integrate these technologies into other services. And that is an area that I think governments are behind on and don't have the answers to yet. Um, but, you know, I think like hopefully we all start to use LLMs to make government services way better. Uh, and both from like how do I enroll in this program to like how do I get better healthcare. But, but if you're in the Indian government, should you be like, we need to set up a team of crack engineers to build our own open AI? I mean, is there a concern for us to say, are we depending on, like for fundamental infrastructure, are we depending on something that's not owned by our country? Yeah, I think it is good to have certainly some sort of AI research effort. What exactly that should do, you know, should that be training ground up LLMs? Should that be pursuing new research directions? Should that be focused on fine tuning open source projects? I think there's a lot of options there and there's, I don't yet like have conviction on the right answer, but some, you know, nationally funded AI effort feels like a good idea. One of the things that I think is so interesting is that OpenAI straddles this line of being a non-profit and a for-profit. And I don't know how, I don't know if I fully understand it. I don't know if many people do. I know you've raised money from investors and Microsoft is definitely one of your shareholders. Uh, when we think about it, is it, do we think of OpenAI as something that's here for society to do societal good? Is it here to make money for its shareholders? Is it both? What happens if those conflict? How, if they, how do if we they think conflict, about that? we're definitely here for the societal good. Like that's super clear, and that's why we put up with all this complication in our structure. So, what is the structure? Can you help us understand what exactly does it look yeah, like? Yeah. So there's like a nonprofit that has a board that governs this thing that we call a capped profit, where our investors can make a certain return. Um, but if we ever need to make a decision that is in favor of societal good, but not in favor of our shareholders. We're set up to do that. Interesting. And one of the most controversial things I heard was that you don't own equity in open AI. W wh why is that? What, what's going um, on? Here? I mean, it started just as like sort of this quirk of our structure where we needed non-conflicted people on the board who didn't have equity, a certain number of them, a certain percentage. And then I kind of just like never got, uh, it, like I forget about it until it comes up in something like this. but. It's, I don't think it's like a particularly noteworthy thing. Like I made a ton of money early in my career. I actively invest, so I expect to make a ton more. I get far more value from, even like personally, selfishly speaking, I get far more value from like all of the other sort of benefits that come from running OpenAI, I get a very interesting life, um, than I would from more money. But most of all, like I just believe that this is going to be the most important project of our time, and I'm super grateful to work on it. If you need me to like send you reminders to to keep up on it, I'm I'm happy to do that. Just let me know. Yeah. So look, a lot of people have flown in here from all around the country to come hear you, and while understanding all this theory about AI is cool, help us do our jobs better. I wanted to put you in a couple roles and tell me, okay, you are now the CEO of a hospital in India. What should you do? And not theoretical, go hire a couple of people. Like, tell, like, help me do my job better. Be my AI for a second here. One of the things that we have heard from a lot of doctors uh, is that they're, they're using ChatGPT with GPT-4 to help come up with new ideas for tricky cases. So, you know, input the symptoms, maybe the test results, say, I can't figure this out. What are some ideas for the differential diagnosis? And in many cases, getting great results back. Awesome. Now let's say you're running a bank. What do you do? This is like rapid fire. No like worries. We're all taking notes <laughs> to, to do our jobs better here. Right? Um, like a sort of traditional like bank branch on the street, that kind of bank, not like an investment operation? Yeah, like a bank, like a traditional bank that issues credit cards and checking accounts and all that stuff. Hmm. Um, I think I would try to just like, on a very brief little side, journey of my career. I once like helped build a mobile banking app and uh, on the side. No, no, it was like it would Okay. Yeah, whatever. Um <laughs> I still think the consumer experience of banking is terrible and could be a lot of it could be replaced by like chatting with an LLM. It's interesting. 
let's say you're running a university, you're a, you're a chancellor, and I, I mean, we've all seen how ChatGPT can definitely affect the education experience. Now, let's say you're running a university. Yeah, that one do? I think is pretty clear. I would just like go redesign the education experience. I would have the equivalent of like personalized tutoring, interactive textbooks. Um, I would like, I would integrate it into like all parts of the learning process. Now, now, just totally theoretically, let's say you're running like a large news media company Real in, tough. in like a market like India, like just as an example, what would you do? And let me just get my pen real quick, but uh, yeah, what would you do? Just tell me. Um, one of the things that, you know, there's, there's been a lot of controversy about whether this is going to be good or bad for the publishing industry and in news in particular. One of the things that we've heard from journalists and reporters who are actually using the the product is that it helps them do the boring parts of their jobs better and they get to spend more time reporting, talking to sources, thinking of ideas. And so I think I would just like encourage everyone to just start using it. And now let's say you are the ministry in India responsible for overseeing technology, AI, et cetera. Um, you know, what, what would you do in that situation? Like what would you be doing today as a regulator? I would say, you know, we have the G20 coming up. India can play like a huge role here in global conversation about what this sort of international regulatory thing might look like. And we are going to really focus on that between now and September and make sure we prioritize that. Interesting. Can you tell us something that you haven't told other people about what's coming from OpenAI? Like maybe just some insider information that we could use in some form? Or, you know, or we kind of tell people what we're working on. Like it's going to get smarter. It's going to get multimodal. We're going to try to like teach it to generate new ideas, come up with, help us like discover more new science. We're going to uh, reduce hallucinations. We're going to give users like more control so no one feels like it's biased or at least it's biased in the way you want it to be biased. We don't have like a lot of secret plans here. I think always as a company to our strength and weakness, we just sort of say what we think and what we're going to try to do. It's amazing. Now, the, one of the most amazing things about you, Sam, is that you are running what is going to be one of the most impactful companies in history. Whenever people say impactful, they, know, they, they, they leave out whether it's going to be a good or a bad impact. That is a very purposeful leave out because we don't know, right? But it's, you, you're going to shape the world with this. We know that. And this isn't your only job, as I understand. Or maybe it's not well, your it's only It's my only, time. like, operating. It's the only thing that I'm, like, in so the trenches Can you for. tell us what else you're doing that's, like exciting you or motivating you outside of open AI, like sure. your, your side hustles, sure. if we put it that way? Um, I think we're going to get nuclear fusion to work in the next few years. At, and importantly, not just as a scientific demonstration, but as incredibly cheap energy and at global scale. So I think other than AI, if you could do one thing that would like really help the world get richer, increase the quality of life. It's very cheap energy. I think there's like a huge historical correlation there. And I think we've all like lost sight of the appropriate ambition level here of how, how much of an impact we could make. But if we can get fusion to work and if we can make enough of it for the world and if it can like cut the energy cost 10x plus, that's pretty great. I'll pick that one. So, so your side gig is nuclear fusion? I don't, I, I, I'm an investor and sort of like helper of that one. It's amazing. So, so just so I understand, you're, you're revolutionizing artificial intelligence and energy. Not you, specifically you, I, but, I think but these those, are like. I think those are the two, my, my basic model of the world uh, is that the cost of intelligence and the cost of energy are kind of what compound in everything else. And if we want a radically better future, those are the two things we should focus on trying to like make abundant. It's incredible. So my last question for you is, what is the most exciting thing that you are seeing globally in your own company? Like what is the thing that outside of everything we are all talking about and seeing that excites you about where open AI or even not just AI in general, what's the most exciting thing ahead? I mean, I, I think it's this generation of, of new scientific progress. If these systems can really contribute additional understanding of the world, to better technology, better science, that, that is like the sustainable way that 
the world actually gets better and that the quality of life increases. We're not there yet. It might be soon, it might take a while, but I believe we are gonna get there. And that will, I think we all underestimate that. It's amazing. Sam, thank you so much. Thank you.